So, we continue with our discussion uh, on electric arc furnace steel making. Today is uh, lecture, this is lecture 27. Uh, and I would uh, like to just quickly recapitulate what we have said, uh, what I have said during my last lecture that uh, uh, arc furnace is a dominant route of steel making, nearly 30 35 percent is produced. Uh, globally through arc furnace steel making and uh, it requires uh, you know huge amount of electricity and of course today arc furnaces are not just you know using scrap they are using also uh, hot metal in addition to other kinds of solid charges and the economic situation actually decides the practice. Uh, hybrid steel making is getting popular that is steel making unit is going to have you know not just a BOF and EF, uh, blast furnace and BOF steel making, but may have other steel making technologies also available uh, in order to exploit the market situation uh, you know whenever it is required, whenever it is required to do so. I have also given you some idea about uh, uh, the kinds of uh, you know furnaces which are used ultra high power furnace, big furnace, small furnaces. Uh, modifications in the furnaces in terms of bottom oxygen blowing, uh, bottom uh, argon blowing for better studying, etc. Uh, and also, I have, I think, uh, towards the end of my lecture, uh, told you regarding, uh, you know, the various kinds of uh, scraps that are used in steel making, electric arc furnace steel making, and what are their likely consequences uh, in terms of the steel quality. So, how do how the behavior of various alloying elements, which are found in scraps. Uh, under steel making conditions. I have given you a brief uh, overview of that uh, as well. Now, if we look at uh, you know uh, the energy balance, uh, basically in the electric arc furnace, I would say uh, that 60 to 65 percent of the total energy requirement of the process. And yesterday I have quoted this figure and I said that around 400 uh, kilojoules per hour, kilo, uh, kilowatt per hour per ton, kilowatt hour per ton. Uh, this is the bare minimum uh, you know uh, energy requirement 350 to 400 just for melting down and then you require 150 to 300 uh, kilowatt hour per ton depending on you know what kind of an furnace you have applied uh, for the efficiency of the furnace and so on and so forth. So, this is the melting heat requirement. So, uh, and we require certainly significantly more uh, energy uh, you know uh, beyond this value of 400. And of the total value, including refining and melt, melting and refining is concerned, 60 to 65 percent would come from uh, electricity, and the balance 30, uh, 5 to 40 percent would come from uh, your oxy fuel burners, which are there. Uh, oxy fuel burners and metalloid oxidations. Solid peak iron is sometimes to get that additional carbon and silicon, so that some heat is you know along with scrap and DRI into the electric arc furnace. Solid uh, peak iron can also be charged and which can contribute uh, to you know this uh, later category that is 35 to 40 percent. So, this is basically the energy input in electric arc furnace and if you look at energy output, uh, we will see 50 to 55 percent of the energy is there in the hot metal itself or in the crude steel. In this case, it is not hot metal, it is crude steel. About 10 percent in slag, about 20 percent in off gas and about 15 to 20 percent you know cooling panels. These are just representative value, this is, this is not an universal value for example. Uh, plus minus 10 percent can take you know depending on the kinds of proportions of hot metal depending on whether it is an ultra high power furnace or a very energy efficient uh, quantum electric arc furnace which is a new terminology in the area of uh, electric arc furnace steel making and uh, sealing of the furnace all these kinds of things the capacity of the furnace surface area to volume ratio. So, the you know within plus minus 10 percent the values are likely to hover around for any electric. Uh, moderate side electric arc uh, furnace. 
Now, in electric arc furnaces, uh, we have, for example, I have also discussed uh, that we have the solid material, which is uh, now this is. I would also like to make one point that I have typically shown you, you know, a geometry of this particular kind, and yesterday, and that's the roof, and then we have uh, the three electrodes. And this is also the lining roof, lining material, and there we have the EBT. That was our construction that we have done, and this is our uh, of gas. This figure I will enlarge later on, uh, but uh, you know uh, today th there is an increasing tendency that. Uh, this uh, the aspect ratio as you can see here may be 0.1 while the aspect ratio in BOF is about 0.4 and when we study little metallurgy we will see that the aspect ratio increases to about 1. So, this is the aspect ratio means the depth of the metal divided by the maximum diameter and that value comes out to be. So, it is a shallow bath basically okay? a system uh, much significantly more shallower than the basic oxygen steel making uh, converters where the depth of liquid to the vessel diameter could be about 0.4 and the little is fairly deep vessel that we will see uh, in a while. And this is our melt. So, we have initially we have lot of you know scrap here that is what it is charged and uh, <coughs> the arc is set in and heat is radiated okay? and as a result of which the arc you know uh, the melt, uh, scrap melts and as the scrap melts the voids get filled up with molten metal and as a result of which gradually what happens is uh, the level uh, goes down and progressively uh, uh, the electrodes are lowered. Uh, initially the charging is not done uh, you know with a full throttle of electrical power because there is going to be huge amount of sparting and the roof etcetera may get damaged. So, gradually as the bath level goes down and down, the power input to the furnace uh, is taken to the you know its, its maximum level, and then uh, you know the melting is expedited. But initially, it is not so uh, large in order to protect the roof, particularly the roof. Now, as far as the shape is concerned, this is a traditional electric arc furnace. But today, if you go to many steel making plants, you will find that uh, you know uh, there, there is a process called con arc process converter and arc uh, the converting come uh, arcing process. So, there is you know in the same kind of a shell geometry you do both converting that means there is an oxygen blowing facility uh, during one stage of the period and during other stage what happens is uh, electric arc furnace kind of a scenario is created. So, if you go twin shell con arc arc process uh, you can find that uh, you know it's it's not that shallow a vessel that the vessel in a conarc process uh, you know could look uh, much deeper than this and there are many plants uh, where you know uh, the converting uh, the same kind of a vessel geometry is being used both both for oxygen uh, you know uh, as well as <coughs> uh, electric arc fund is still making converters. Now, we can understand initially why the bath was one you know we wanted the bath to be shallow because in the trendy, in the good old days we did not have any bottom blowing facilities iron ore used to be the bath. So, just like you know this concept was perhaps I think uh, has been borrowed uh, you know from the hearth steel making process and we have seen that in the case of Bessemer steel making process the converter you know the aspect ratio the depth of metal is significant to the extent of 0.4 or so, but go to hearth furnace, open hearth furnaces, the bath is really shallow because there you know you require a large surface area and if you have a big depth dip then in that case you cannot produce good stirring and you cannot have good rates of heat and mass transfer uh, which are characteristics of steel making process. But now with bottom stirring and oxygen lancing involved there is no reason why we should have such a wide furnace actually okay? it could have now because we, if, you, if you put in you know argon through the bottom okay in that case the bottom the metal can be starred and since you can 
you know impart studying to the system so there is no constraint that why should we restrict ourselves to a, this kind of an aspect ratio uh, and cannot go you know to a scenario where it is approaching uh, that of the basic still making process and that is the trend that has come this way is people have realized that they don't have to really you know go into this kind of a saucer geometry or rather a bof kind of a geometry can also work and that's why in the same shell people have been people are blowing uh, you know both oxygen as well as and this varies from plant to plant so there is no generality i mean you can say that professor majumdar has drawn furnace geometry but well i see in this company factory that the you know uh, the furnace is uh, looks more like a bof converter so that points needs to be appreciated that uh, it is no more universal and particularly with the introduction of bof you know bottom stirring facilities in the furnace as well as an oxygen lancing facility in the system one can dispense with uh, you know a lesser aspect ratio kind of a geometry and that can help expedite uh, the reaction rate uh, to a certain extent <clears throat> so melting uh, you know depending on the size of the furnace you know uh, whether you are talking of an ultra high power furnace or not uh, the duration of the melting can itself can be half an hour 45 minutes and so on and so forth so and as i have indicated also that during yesterday that during the meltdown period itself oxygen is also blown uh, in the because in the high temperature there is a chemical heat which is also evolved because of the oxidation of the scrap okay some this oxygen can help in some iron oxidation as well as metal iron oxidation and as a result of which additional heat can be liberated and that's why uh, the melting can be expedited so once meltdown takes place okay meltdown we say that melting is over so we say uh, meltdown period is finished then comes the refining stages of still making still making process and in the refining process uh, you know we must understand that we have to create a slag here and that slag because uh, the scrap itself will not contain significant amount of you know if if the charge is about 60% or so scrap you will have you know very little silicon contributing coming out from the scrap itself uh, very little phosphorus coming out from the slag so as such the slag volume is not going to be significantly high of course with the introduction of more and more liquid metal here the volume of the slag could be really large <coughs> uh, in the uh, arc furnace itself now let us look at the process gives us you know if if you following melting if we want to look at uh, the refining period uh, refining is quite versatile here in electric arc furnace uh, because it's a small tonnage of productions and uh, you know uh, we really have to don't have to you know there, there's not something that is seating before it like a blast furnace producing hot metal so there is a thrust in producing of course uh, today i think uh, the refining period and meltdown period have been substantially reduced because of the introduction of many technologies but <coughs> you know in terms of the maneuverability of the quality of steel uh, there is a huge uh, you know uh, what do you call margin in this particular case itself for example if you have to make a slag okay prepare a slag and of it is always a basic slag never an acidic slag that that we have to remember so lime has needs to be added here okay now we can have an oxidizing slag made which we call as a single oxidizing slag suppose we say that uh, the charge contains mostly uh, you know scrap contains mostly carbon it's a plain steel scrap we have used and it may contain some amount of you know aluminum and silicon also uh, particularly coming from deoxidation which you have not covered yet the next topic is deoxidation of steel making and then we will be clear so little bit of silicon little bit of aluminum little bit of you know and carbon can be there so you can have an oxidizing slag and because it's a scrap 100% scrap based charge you just have an oxidizing slag to take care of your whatever silicon silica is formed whatever alumina is formed and this is a single oxidizing slag practice so you will add lime you will add you know little bit of silica uh, will add spar and then make uh, uh, what do you call <coughs> a 
synthetic slag here and then as the process goes on uh, you know some iron oxide will be generated in the system because of oxygen injection and not only oxygen is used but also the oxidizing agent uh, could be so the varied proportion these are the two oxidizing agents which are basically used in the system. So, predominantly to drive out carbon okay, and remove some of the trace elements which could be present in steel one typically practices an oxidizing slag and this slag has more or less similar kind of a uh, you know uh, what you call uh, composition as that of the BOF steel making. But note that maybe it is you know uh, not possible to go to a very high value of basicity like 3.5 or 4 and neither it is desirable also in this particular case because of lower impurity content. So, this will allow us if you make a single oxidizing slag and you put in oxygen by thermodynamics we can say silicon aluminum uh, will be oxidized join the slag phase and also carbon is going to be eliminated. Now and in this particular period uh, because you do not want to do phosphorus removal. So, you cannot you can work with a less basic slag. Okay. <coughs> double oxidizing slag and this what it does is double oxidizing slag that you will make one slag remove all these impurities and then in the next you will remove the slag prepare a fresh slag and through the fresh slag which is a high basic slag what you are going to do you are eliminate the phosphorus which is uh, present in the system. Okay. But you must understand the moment you tap one slag and you prepare another fresh slag uh, the thermal requirement of the process increases significantly because you know the first oxidizing slag depending on the furnace size could be 2 tons, 3 tons even 4 tons okay. and this 4 tons of material at 1600 degrees centigrade you are dumping outside and how much of heat which you have generated through electricity is being thrown you can appreciate that point. So, with single oxidizing slag by adding you know unless you have a detrimental elements if you want to throw away that slag you can always also not practice you know this was done earlier but today I think very few people use as double uh, oxidizing uh, slag. <coughs> But double slag practice is quite common, double slag practice. There is a difference between double slag practice. If the customer wants that you have to have you know uh, not only ultra low carbon, but you have to have ultra low phosphorus and ultra low sulphur. And we have seen from our study of chemical reactions in steel making uh, that sulphur requires a reducing environment and oxygen phosphorus removal requires an oxidizing it. But both of these will require basic slags. Double slag practice means that you have first an oxidizing slag, you remove the slag and then you have a reducing slag. Obviously, you understand that you know if you have both sulphur and phosphorus very low in steel. So, that means the price of the steel is going to be large. So, even though you may be you know throwing away the slag, the heat economy is going to be comparable here because you are going to remove the oxidizing slag then you prepare a fresh reducing slag and this reducing slag or a neutral slag could be you know uh, carbidic slag uh, or with even aluminum uh, aluminous you know you can prepare that reducing slag which has negligible oxygen potential okay there's no fuo content and there will be no oxygen glowing during the reducing slag period you must understand you can have just good amount of stirring from the bottom and you know there is no oxidation because the moment you put in ox this addition of this the oxygen oxidation period gets over the moment you throw away the oxidizing slag and during this period what you have you have you know eliminated carbon and uh, phosphorus both and then you prepare a fresh slag and then that fresh basic slag can eliminate sulfur <coughs> also and then at the end what have you have gotten is uh, both low sulfur low phosphorus and low sulphur steel. And the fourth practice is that you have an oxidizing slag converted to a reducing slag. In this case the slag is initially oxidizing. So, it has high content of iron oxide okay? and then you do not remove the slag, but what you convert you you know 
reduce the oxygen content of the slag by addition of you know reducing agents and why why you want to do that you want to do that because it will be you know this concept the fourth kind of a slag is very important when you have uh, what is known as a partially oxidizable elements present in the scrap that means you want to capture those elements we will see that the relevance of this when we will talk about uh, stainless steel making that as you try to oxidize carbon okay chromium also gets oxidized and chromium joins in the slag phase but i don't want to lose that chromium so i want to reduce the slag and from the slag phase you know uh, chromium oxide can be reduced and then win back into the metal phase itself so in that case what happens is obviously you are not talking about you cannot remove phosphorus in this case because the moment you reduce phosphorus what will what is going to happen the you know the slag converted the reducing slag the phosphorus will come back so this kind of a steel basically will have carbon as the impurity which you can drive out with an driving out of carbon will require an oxidizing slag because unless you pump in oxygen carbon will not get oxidized so either fe2 o3 or o2 lancing will the moment carbon is oxidizing there will be elements like silicon which will also be oxidizing there will be elements like you know uh, aluminum which will also be oxidizing there will be you know uh, elements like chromium which also will be oxidizing now of this if you want to win back that some of the elements you know particularly the chromium you say silicon and silicon uh, as well as aluminum as i have indicated yesterday that they belong to you know a completely oxidizable element and that we have seen when we are talking about buf that within the first 3 minutes the silicon carb really you know uh, falls down like anything and touches uh, the abscess uh, which corresponds to zero silicon virtually zero silicon content in the uh, crude steel so you can you have along with chromium the condition along with carbon the conditions were like that that some elements have oxidized some elements which you desire to be present in the hot metal but you could not ensure that because of the thermodynamic reasons so it has oxidized and it has gone through the slag phase and now you want to win back those elements and this is particularly contextual when we will discuss you know uh, stainless steel making so this is oxidizing slag converted to a reducing slag the moment you tap remove the oxidizing slag oxygen is to be shut off if it will three so fresh slag is going to be now so no fresh slag is going to be prepared in this fourth category so you have now a slag here which may contain some iron oxide etc and the moment you will add calcium carbide or maybe you, you may add some amount of uh, silicon also into it in that case or some amount of aluminum shots into it then what happens is because if you uh, if he has less affinity towards oxygen in comparison to aluminum and silicon so if he is going to come back and then you will have silica alumina which are going to be fixed having very low activities here and it is going to be virtually a neutral slag on the other hand okay in this particular case double slag practice as i have said this involves uh, that you have you want to remove both sulfur and phosphorus uh, okay and then phosphorus is removed during the oxidizing slag oxidizing period and then uh, following that once you uh, remove the oxidizing slag you cut off or you shut down oxygen blowing as well as iron ore addition and you just continue with your bottom stirring and then you know have the second slag ready basic slag ready which is essentially reducing in nature containing no iron oxide practically double oxidizing slag uh, is uh, rarely necessary the single oxidizing slag serves the purpose and this can if you want to remove carbon phosphorus both so here also you can do carbon phosphorus both and the economics if you can do it better here because uh, once you eliminate carbon then you can have you know high and silicon etc then you can have a little bit more basicity and then by using more basicity you should be able to remove both uh, carbon which will eliminate as carbon monoxide and phosphorus will go to the slag as phosphates but if you are theoretically speaking if you are fussy that you want to you know have a very low phosphorus no sulfur is to be eliminated then the first oxidizing slag is removed again the fresh slag is prepared and again you pump in oxygen into the metal material and this obviously you know with if you, if you, if you revisit our fundamentals is not going to be quite economic because of uh, you know loss of heat uh, with slag going out of the system as well as you know 
Again, I have oxy oxidation of some fresh iron because of oxygen lancing because it is a double oxidation slack practice. So, there are obvious reasons uh, that one does not frequently use this. So, oxidizing slack practice which is same in principle as the basic oxygen steel making process. These are the two things to you know uh, because in basic steel making we have seen the BF steel making we cannot produce ultra uh, low sulfur seal because the simple fact that we have an intensely oxidizing environment and what when you want to reduce the sulfur you know and as I have indicated the first step is the pretreatment and then following primary steel making we will go to the secondary steel making then little desulfurization is another technique whereby we can reduce sulfur and bring it to you know uh, as low as 10 ppm perhaps. Okay? But per se in oxygen steel making process uh, during the primary steel making in a basic oxygen converter we cannot remove sulfur, but the double slack practice in an electric arc furnace gives us this opportunity you know by practicing oxidizing as well as reducing slack to eliminate both phosphorus as well as sulfur from the charged material. And this is a in alloy steel making the last category of steel making you know is becomes very important because some elements tend to be lost from the melt which you want to recover uh, and unwarrantedly they join the slack phase. And this kind of a practice allows us to win back and they have a tremendous influence on the economics of the steel making process because otherwise in steel making stainless steel making we will see that if you cannot really win back chromium in that case what you have to do we have to replenish chromium into the charge and that is not going to be advantageous at least from the economic uh, point of view. So, there is quite a bit of versatility in terms of what you want to produce you know uh, in electric arc furnace. We must understand that in the arc furnace basically what you do is you know, when you do decarburization as well as <coughs> uh, some removal of silicon phosphorus etcetera. If you, if you want to make alloy steels we normally do not make it in the arc furnace itself. Alloying will not be done in the arc furnace and you must also understand that uh, because of uh, you know not so good stirring particularly in those furnaces where we have uh, you know we do not have bottom stirring facilities yet installed. So, the system is not going to be quite close to equilibrium we cannot expect that there is equilibrium between dissolved oxygen and FeO content of the slag because system will operate far away and this in this way the state of equilibrium in the system is close to the LD converter okay? not uh, close to the I have drawn a plot if you remember uh, percentage carbon tap carbon versus FeO content of the slag and I have shown that there is you know BOF the bottom stirring comes uh, bottom blowing oxygen still making comes here cube up and your LD still making is here. And if you look at the arc furnace still making the arc furnace still making is also somewhere here this is the arc furnace band. And this is because of the simple fact that you know it is a shallow furnace and the state of stirring may not be uh, that <coughs> good in the system. So, we can have uh, you know um, quite a bit of, uh, uh, of iron oxide in the slag itself and adding addition of alloying elements may not be quite advantageous uh, because they tends to be reacting with uh, the iron oxide of the slag and rather than getting into steel making it an alloy steel. Uh, slag will tend to eat up those additions. More importantly however, that the economics, economics of steel making warrants that only decarburization and de dephosphorization needs to be carried out in the primary steel making vessel. Be it BOF steel making, be it EF steel making only decarburization and dephosphorization needs to be and when it takes we say decarburization only because as carbon is eliminated very in a very short time silicon will also be eliminated. So, we do not talk about silicon removal. So, that is why we give a more emphasis on decarburization and dephosphorization. So, primary steel making vessel needs to be used only as for decarburization and dephosphorization. And then once the heat is made then what happens is the, the metal will of course just you know contain quite a bit of dissolved oxygen could be from 300 to 600 700 ppm of dissolved oxygen there depending on what kind of a. So, you will deoxidize the bath and then you are going to make uh, alloy steels and further processing because you are not making carbon steel here. 
In electric arc furnace steel making processes, we will be mostly making various kinds of alloy steels as I have indicated, free cutting steel, tool steel, uh, ball bearing steel and so many varieties of steel that is to be produced. But that starts once you, uh, you know, partially or completely deoxidize uh, the steel bath and then the addition. So, so the alloy steel making is a different uh, forte altogether. It is beyond the arc furnace steel making, beyond decarburization and dephosphorization and they are going to be made in lentils. So, we will have, we have an EBT here. So, and we have a ladle which is a cylindrical vessel which will be sitting here and this vessel you know could be about L by D ratio 1.4. So, if you fill it up up to 1, so you will have some empty space here and that is the freeboard of the ladle because you are going to transfer it the ladle. So, the meniscus is going to go like this and as a result of which you require some freeboard otherwise the metal is going to spill over. Okay? So, from you can just little bit of tilt it and the molten metal is going to be drained. And we must understand that in this now we have, uh, we are going to use it, uh, we have carbon as the required level. Only thing which is not up to our expectation is the dissolved oxygen level. We have eliminated carbon, we have eliminated phosphorus. So, as far as the composition of basic composition of steel is concerned, uh, you know it is fine except perhaps for, except uh, for the dissolved oxygen content of steel. So, now the EBT, we do not want any, if you want to eliminate this oxygen, we will not like slack to come here. Okay? This slack contains large amount of FeO and if you have an, this is called a carryover slack problem in steel industries. Today, production of quality steel and the economics of steel making demands that the slack from the primary steel making vessel need not be carried over to the ladle during the tapping stage. So, emptying of a furnace typically is termed as tapping. We will also discuss this a little bit brief, you know, uh, in detail uh, later on. So, once you tap it, so you have, you do not want to, uh, so the furnace is going to be tilted uh, 8 degrees, you know, up, maybe up to 18 degrees or so uh, to drain out most of the material, and taking precaution that uh, slag is not carried over to the ladle. And we have slag detection facilities here. The moment a little bit of slag goes in, alarm is raised and the furnace is again brought back to the original position, preventing any further drainage of slag. Today, we have you know, facilities uh, which ensure uh, less than 0.1 percent FeO in the, and this slag here basically protects uh, uh, the metal, it you know, contains the heat. Uh, so, it is an insulating kind of a thing and also once the it is over, the ladle is going to be physically covered also, so that we do not allow heat to escape. So, that's, that's, that is a refractory line vessel and the cover allows the, you know, protects the metal from losing its heat and uh, making the metal exposed to the environment. So, then comes the stage of deoxidation which we will discuss uh, later on. So, alloy steel making is going to be done for example, here and various kinds of alloy steel steels have been prepared. Uh, I will just uh, you know for example, as I said that alloy steel making will follow once you eliminate uh, oxygen out of uh, from the melt itself and then only you can add elements like chromium etcetera. Otherwise, the chromium added will react with oxygen, it is going to 600 ppm oxygen and then the chromium rather than dissolving into steel will form oxide and it is going to go to the slag which is floating above. Okay? So, the recovery of the alloying elements is going to be significantly smaller if oxygen is not removed from the system. So, following deoxidation we can uh, have uh, what do you call uh, the alloying addition and alloy steel making, but during you know uh, we can also uh, have for example, um, uh, alloy steel made in ladles which are not fully or completely deoxidized. Basically, oxygen removal is done by addition of silicon and aluminum. It is important for me to just touch a little bit about deoxidation in the context of discussing alloy steel making and one case uh, the ball bearing steel making that I want to elucidate to you very briefly uh, warrants that uh, you know I talk about it a little bit. So, silicon and oxygen 
uh, aluminum which has great affinity towards oxygen are going to be added to steel okay? and they are going to help removing oxygen and the consequence of it we will study when we study the oxidation. So, we can bring down for example, oxygen level from 600 ppm by addition if you add aluminum uh, we can bring it down to 10 ppm or something like that virtually which is a comp called kill steel okay? and silicon will allow us you know, to get about 100 ppm or so. So, we can get by addi addi controlling the amount of additions we can control the level of dissolved oxygen in the bath itself. Now, in the making of ball bearing steel, the ball bearing steel basically contains it is a ultra high machinable steel or leaded steel for example, is made the leaded steel are basically made uh, you know after deoxidation. So, you will deoxidize the bath and then we will add lead shots, but it is not so easy lead, uh, lead has a very you know high vapor pressure under steel making condition and the lead is much more heavier than steel. So, lead tends to segregate uh, in the vessel. So, you have added lead, lead becomes liquid some lead uh, you know, lead recovery is extremely poor because of vaporization of lead and uh, what happens is within the lead unless you have good amount of stirring uh, liquid lead which has very low solubility in steel you know uh, does not really uh, mix. So, there is tremendous tends to be tremendous concentration in homogeneities. Now, as far as ball bearing steel is concerned ball bearing steel uh, is can be is made economically ball bearing steel particularly we use um, you know manganese and chromium this is the two alloying additions and chromium the you know resource material is uh, low carbon ferrochrome low carbon ferrochrome or high carbon ferrochrome high carbon ferrochrome hc high carbon ferrochrome these are the two materials which provides the source for uh, chromium in the <coughs> steel. The low carbon ferrochrome tends to be very expensive, it contains very low amount of carbon and high carbon ferrochrome for example, uh, is cheaper, but it contains uh, quite a bit of you know uh, carbon into it. Uh, because uh, this uh, uh, ferrolla making you know you, you have submerged arc furnaces where, where you use carbothermic reduction and that is how uh, the carbon gets into uh, the ferrochrome which is made uh, basically essentially in the submerged uh, arc furnaces uh, <coughs> through carbothermic reductions. So, if you if you want to use low carbon ferrochrome uh, you know the cost of production will go up significantly for ball bearing steel if you use high carbon ferrochrome you have another problem because the carbon that you have eliminated in the arc furnace has now come back. Uh, to steel. Okay? So, it is at one you know you target it that uh, uh, I you know some amount of uh, high, high carbon ferrochrome uh, can be used. So, there has to be a compromise between the two. Okay? So, we can have a mixture of high carbon ferrochrome and low carbon ferrochrome. Also, you can understand that this carbon okay, which is there in the system uh, in, the, in the ferro alloy because we have about 600 ppm oxygen already I have not oxidized it to a significant extent. If we add high carbon ferrochrome then the high carbon ferrochrome the carbon content in high carbon ferrochrome can be used to partially deoxidize the bath. Okay? So, in that case what happens is that if you, if you have a mixture of low carbon instead of just adding low carbon ferrochrome and making the process more expensive. But low carbon ferrochrome addition will give you no problem as regard to the carbon because you have established the correct amount of carbon in the electric arc furnace during a single oxidizing slack period. So, initially what happens is if you add high carbon ferrochrome a bath containing dissolved oxygen in that case carbon can oxidize with uh, what you call <coughs> oxygen and uh, also, because chromium has a good affinity towards oxygen okay, at that temperature 1600 degree centigrade some chromium is also going to be oxidized, but we all know that if you have high basicity because chromium oxide tends to behave in steel making as a basic oxide and same thing what I have to talked to you or told you regarding MnO oxidation when I was talking about blast furnace reactions that 
high basicity slag will prevent manganese from getting from the melt to the slag phase same is going to happen here also that we will have <coughs> uh, you know uh, if you have if you have chromium uh, then uh, this chromium will not like to get oxidized when we have a large basicity. So, you use high carbon ferrochrome, but now you have to ensure that if you add high carbon ferrochrome, I have to preferentially oxidize carbon and not oxidize Fe or not oxidize chromium. Okay? That strategy you have to uh, you know, adopt in this particular case itself. So, using a high basicity slag with calcium oxide, a relatively more higher temperature. Okay? That means, you are tapping this furnace at 5 to 10 degrees more temperature. Why temperature? Because at you know, higher is the temperature, then carbon has a greater affinity towards oxygen. Okay? Carbon monoxide is a much more stable phase. So, carbon will preferentially react with this oxygen and chromium will be sitting idle. It will be just watching that you know, uh, when carbon takes that oxygen away because the temperature has been high. And also, in the little because now there is no stirring. If you have you know argon blown into the ladle, because all ladles, as we will see later on, uses argon stirring. And that bubble inter bubble surface, bubble liquid surface is a site for reaction, and because you have introduced more amount of argon, so what is going to happen is that we have uh, the slag metal reactions expedited and also the partial pressure of carbon monoxide is going to be relatively higher okay? and as a result of which uh, relatively lower because you have more number of bubbles here because you are putting in more number of more volumes of argon. So, higher basicity as such high carbon ferrochrome you cannot add. Okay? Just simply dumping high carbon ferrochrome will produce bad result in terms of significant amount of chromium loss from the system. But adding replacing a part of the low carbon ferrochrome by high carbon ferrochrome to save on expenses. Okay? If you can maneuver your processing parameters well, meaning that if you can in control your basicity or use a little bit of higher basicity, you can use a little bit of higher bath temperature and if you can use somewhat more argon purging, then you should be in a position to use this high carbon uh, ferrochrome to a good extent as a replacement material of low carbon ferrochrome for making of ball bearing steel. Okay? Of course, you can deoxidize the bath, okay? you can deoxidize the bath, remove oxygen altogether and then you can add chromium or low carbon ferrochrome and it is a piece of cake, but that may not be economically advantageous because you know there is a significant difference factor of I I will give you maybe in the next class that what is the exact figure, but I think it is 7 times more expensive uh, than you know, low carbon ferrochrome than the high carbon uh, ferrochrome. So, uh, you know using low carbon ferrochrome is very easy in a deoxidized bath, okay, no novelty is involved there, but the you know cost of production uh, is going to be significantly higher. So, if you can judiciously control your parameters, more lime you are using here, you know that is the cost, more argon. And then, if you can, you know, play with your proportion of carbon, uh, low carbon ferrochrome and high, high carbon ferrochrome. All these additional expenses, five degree high temperature, all these additional expenses can be balanced, and maybe a profitable scenario can be worked out. And indeed, uh, this was worked out in one of the steel plants where I was working, and it did produce. A, you know, uh, the company was using low carbon ferrochrome uh, all the time, and then about, you know, forty-five. To 50 percent of the low carbon ferrochrome we could replace with high carbon ferrochrome and um, in a part ton of material there is a significant savings and these are all small steel plants you know even little bit of saving uh, is very critical for them and that they do not have you know significant R and D activities or, um, or R and D capabilities rather uh, you know on a daily basis they cannot really improvise processes. So, wherever there is an opportunity if some improvement can be done and particularly if the process in terms of processing time, in terms of material consumption, in terms of better process economics that is going to offer quite a bit of respite to the arc furnace still making in those you know steel plants which are facing tough competition from their bigger uh, counterparts. There are a lot of developments which have taken place in the electric arc furnace and all those developments have been borrowed from the basic oxygen steel making process. So, we want to you know, incre increase the refining rates, we want to 
make more and more hits. So if you can reduce the meltdown period, we will be able to make more hits. Making a hit means making one batch of steel. That's what is a called heat. Okay. So <coughs> we have furnace life increased because of water cooling panels of roof, etc. That is, uh, you know, new design of cooling actually protects the furnace uh, quite well. Then this has a bottom bottom stirring. Then to expedite the melting and refining period, ultra high power furnace. Then we have uh, foamy slag for protection of uh, electrodes. We have no slag entrainment, eccentric uh, bottom trapping. Uh, we have oxygen lancing. We have post combustion. Thirty to thirty-five percent of heat is, uh, you know, from post combustion are going to be routed back in the process itself. There is a process which I have mentioned briefly. It's called the constill process. Constill process. So this gas which goes out, okay. And then there is a you know, bigger chamber here and that we have scraps. So the gas flows something like this. And this goes something like there is an arrangement here for So the gas lives here, the gas flows, hot gas flows and this is the scrap material okay? and the gas goes this way, the scrap through on a conveyor belt moves this way. So in the process, you know, hot gas comes in contact with the cold scrap, scrap and this scrap is uh, fed into the furnace. Uh, there are also, so this you, know, you can imagine if the scrap is fed at 400 degrees centigrade as opposed to 25 degree and you are using 60 ton charge, you know, 60 ton uh, in a 60 ton electric arc furnace, 60 percent of the charge, you can very easily calculate that heating this, preheating this scrap, <coughs> how much of energy you are going to save. And this heat is coming from the heat of the waste gas itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So, this is our scrap. And this scrap is moving in this particular direction while the hot gas is moving in the opposite direction. The counter current flow, heat exchange takes place and as a result of which you get hot strap which you can charge into the. There are also uh, uh, furnaces uh, which you call the twin shell electric arc furnace. Okay? So, uh, there will be another shell in which the charge would be preheating and then the same roof and the electrode will be you know, uh, swinging once the meltdown and refining is over here then the electrodes are taken. So, we will not allow the electrodes to cool down okay? and then the electrode is moved over the second shell and then there the melting starts. So, there is a shuttling between uh, the two alternating shells where one is used for preheating and uh, the other is used for uh, refining. So, all these kinds of technologies have come including post combustion uh, for uh, recovery of heats or making the process uh, thermally more economic and because the electricity is going getting to be you know, it's, it's a not a cheap commodity, so it's very expensive. You know, so the consumption of electricity uh, decides the competitiveness of the electric arc furnace itself. Basically, uh, there are good. You know, in any <coughs> plant, if you go, there is a good supervisory control system at place, just like the basic oxygen steel making process. I have said that in basic steel making, oxygen steel making process, for example, we had many developments. I have mentioned one about this. Uh, <coughs> slag splashing technique, post combustion technique and process control and instrumentation, instrumentation. And same in electric arc furnace also, there is quite a bit of you know, process control and one such control is the off gas control where you have a probe which is attached here okay, and which measures uh, temperature as well as composition of the hot gas. 
And this forms the basis of process control. This, you know, there are algorithms. So these are connected to PLCs, to computers, to an operating system. Okay, and then uh, you know there are <coughs> what you call a control room where all these things are there, and from there, uh, uh, normally uh, you know these are probes, and these are basically it's a high temperature here, so these are water cooled probe. of gas monitoring device. So, we will find out how much of carbon monoxide is there, how much of carbon dioxide is there okay, in the off gas. Also, the off gas temperature can also be uh, found out and based on this temperature as well as uh, the off gas composition, requisite idea and corrective measures can be uh, derived for the furnace uh, operation itself. So, merely probe will not do, the probe will require some kind you know the probe data is going to be analyzed some algorithms are going to be needed, some computers are going to be needed okay? and then there has to be a control room where you know manual intervention will be necessary to read out the implication and you know suggest corrective measures. So, a significant amount of uh, developments in electric arc furnace also ta has taken place and I think last 30 years uh, almost whatever the developments have taken place in basic oxygen furnaces those have been very nicely adapted uh, to the electric arc furnace steel making arena also making uh, arc furnace uh, you know highly competitive and particularly when an electric arc furnace is coupled you know with the endless strip casting process uh, it you know gives neck to neck competition with the BOF steel making process and as I have indicated that you know the future of steel making possibly uh, you know will rely to a large extent on the conversion of scrap to liquid steel and connecting it to endless strip casting process whereby a near net shape product is going to be made. So, this much is enough for our electric arc furnace steel making and I want to now talk about uh, in the context of arc furnace uh, uh, stainless steel making a little bit more detail because that is a very good <coughs> subject to know about because of the consumption of stainless steel is being increasing on a daily basis and I will also give you uh, the relative price of uh, high carbon versus low carbon ferromanganese uh, ferrochromium uh, so that you have an idea. Uh, of the advantage, economic advantages that one can really uh, get by replacing, you know, uh, or replenishing uh, low carbon ferrochromium by high, high carbon ferrochromium, particularly in the manufacture of high chromium grade steel, alloy steels such as uh, ball bearing steel, etc. So, we will continue.